Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to BDO's Corporate Criminal Offence webinar. Um, this afternoon, we are uh, delighted to welcome uh, Jen Hazlitt, who is Head of Corporate Crime at HMRC. That's the job title, I think. Um, and we're also going to have a number of us from BDO also giving our, our take on these new rules. Um, a couple of housekeeping points. So if you do have any problems with the webinar as we go through, you can't hit the sound or whatever, do email in. Um, and also we would encourage people to email in any questions they have as we go through. And hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end of the webinar to run a few of, uh, through a few of those answers. So without further ado, I'd invite uh, Jen to give us uh, HMRC's take on these new rules. Over to you, Jen. Hello, everyone. So I think some of you are probably quite well versed in the new corporate offences already, but for others of you, this may be the first time that you're really starting to grapple with what these offences mean for you and what they mean for your business. So I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of an overview about how both offences work, but what we're really going to focus in on is the reasonable procedures. So what is it your business needs to be thinking about and actively doing now in advance of these offences coming into force in September of this year? Now, there's quite a lot of material to cover, and we certainly don't have time to cover everything in detail. So I would encourage you, if you do have a question, if I say something and you don't understand it, or you want more information, please do submit a question, and we will try and cover it. So firstly, the most important thing to remember is that we're not talking about one offence. We're talking about two offences, and they are distinct offences, both criminal offences that apply to corporations. But actually, how we define them in the legislation is not corporation, but a relevant body. So what we're really talking about is criminal offences that apply to legal entities, so anything that isn't a natural person, so a man or a woman. Now, that could be a commercial organization, it could be a business, it could be a charity, it could be a partnership. Anything that is a legal entity, we're not just talking about profit-making businesses. Now, these relevant bodies can be liable for failing to prevent persons associated with them from criminally facilitating tax evasion. So what we have there are three stages. Now, hopefully, if we can look to the slide with three stages, which hopefully is coming up on your screen in a moment. There we go. So if you look at the three stages on your screen, what we need are all three of these stages for a relevant body to be liable under either of the offenses. So let's just take a look at the domestic offense for a moment. So stage one, you need to have a taxpayer that has committed criminal tax evasion under the existing law. Now that could be a man or woman, we could be talking about personal taxes, or it could be an entity. We could be talking about VAT, or we could be talking about corporation taxes. What you need is a taxpayer that has committed tax evasion. Now, for those of you pondering the question, well, what is the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance? Uh, the answer is fraud. What we're talking about here are deliberate and dishonest acts by taxpayers. You cannot commit tax evasion by accident. You cannot really commit tax evasion negligently you have to have the required mens rea. So we're always thinking about that deliberate and dishonest intent by the taxpayer. Now that's something that's been a criminal for a very long time and there's a lot of case law around that. So stage one, you need an offense under the existing law of tax evasion. Stage two, you need a professional to have deliberately and dishonestly facilitated that tax evasion, or as we sometimes call it, been knowingly concerned in it. Again, it's been a crime for a very long time for an individual to deliberately help another individual to commit crime. I think 1861 is the oldest reference I could find in statute, but there are many other acts relevant to this. So again, what we're talking about is an individual, man or woman, committing an act that is already criminal under the existing law. So if you have stage one, and that's been criminally facilitated by someone at stage two, the only thing that is new is that a corporation or a relevant body can be liable for failing to prevent that stage two action, that green action on your screen from happening. So an easy way to conceptualize it is to think, if you have, let's say, an individual banker or an individual lawyer or an accountant who is in the dock on a charge of facilitating tax evasion, their company can sit right alongside them, that entity that they're providing services for or on behalf of can sit right alongside them in a dock on the charge of having failed to prevent that from happening. Now, stages one, two, and three, the prosecution is going to have to prove to the criminal standard of beyond all reasonable doubt. 
but stage three, for those of you who work in law, is actually a strict liability offence. So if stages one and stages two have happened, stage three is automatic. Now what the defendant or the company or the corporation can do if it wishes is put forward a defence of having put in place reasonable procedures designed to prevent that stage two facilitation act from happening. That the defence proves to that lower standard, that civil standard of on the balance of probabilities. So that is essentially how the new domestic offence work. Now that applies to all categories of taxation as well as national insurance. Now, the overseas fraud offence, which is now on your slideshow, works in exactly the same way. We still need those three stages. So we still need a criminal tax offence by a taxpayer, deliberately and dishonestly being enabled by a professional, and then the company that they are providing services for or on behalf of can be liable for having failed to prevent it. But we also need something called dual criminality. And all that means is the country that is suffering the tax loss, so the example on your slides is Germany, has to recognize stages one and stages two as a crime in their jurisdiction. They don't have to have a comparable corporate criminal offense. And Germany is the example we use here because Germany is actually constitutionally prohibited from having corporate criminal liability. But as long as they recognize deliberate and dishonest non-payment of taxes as a criminal offense and deliberately helping someone to do that as a criminal offense, the corporation that has a person providing services for or on its behalf that has deliberately enabled that tax evasion in a country other than the UK can be liable in the UK. Now, it's worth briefly pausing there for a moment and looking at the remit of the domestic offence and the overseas offence. The domestic offence applies to anybody, wherever based or incorporated, that is providing those services to a UK taxpayer. So it can apply to any business based anywhere in the world. That business does not have to have a presence in the UK. So if you are an entity that is, let's say, incorporated in Panama and has branches or offices in a number of jurisdictions but not the UK, that's fine. You can still be liable in the UK if one of your associated persons criminally facilitates a UK tax loss. Now, it's slightly different for the overseas fraud offence. So we exercise jurisdiction for the domestic offence by the virtue of the UK tax loss, and that's exactly how it works under the law as it currently stands. The overseas fraud offence applies to businesses who either carry out a business or part of a business activity in the UK, so if you have an office or a branch or a headquarters in the UK, or where that stage two criminal action actually physically happens in the UK. So for example, if you were a Swiss bank and you have offices in Germany and France, but no offices in the UK, but one of your staff members flies to London Heathrow and helps a French taxpayer to commit the evasion of French taxes, that business can be liable in the UK despite not normally carrying out a business activity in the UK. So now we're going to turn to what everyone is actually interested in, and that is the reasonable procedures defence. Now, the legislation provides for a company to put forward a defence to show that its procedures that it had in place at the time of that stage two criminal offence were reasonable, or that it was reasonable to have no present prevention procedures in place. Now, I have had many, many financial services firms, big multinational firms, look very relieved at this point and say, oh, excellent, I don't need any prevention procedures. I'm afraid that is simply not the case. If you work in a high-risk area or if you are a large multinational, if you have, for example, a substantial payroll department, you really need to be aware of the risks and take measures to address those risks. The no defense or the no procedures necessary defense is very much designed for those people at the thin end of the wedge. So um, I tend to conceptualize it by thinking of the three person coffee shop that sells me my coffee on the way to work in the morning, not the very large multinational financial institution providing advice to clients on how to invest their money. So the question then I think for probably everyone on the call is, what do I need to do? What are reasonable procedures looking like? Now, we consulted on draft guidance for this last year and produced that dated guidance, which was published in October of last year. And the big call from business was, this is based on Section 7 of the Bribery Act, the only other failure to prevent model out there. And what the guidance for the Bribery Act does is take a principles-based approach. So it doesn't produce a checklist of 100 things you need to do to have a safe harbor. It says, in order for your business to work out what you need to do to protect yourself, take a risk-based approach, 
follow these six principles. And if you follow these six principles, you will find what works for your business. So if we just briefly go through some of the principles. Number one, which you should see on your screens in red, do a risk assessment. Everything you do hangs off your risk assessment. Now, this is not an assessment of the risks that your clients or the taxpayers that you are working with present. It's not about knowing your customers or knowing your clients. This is about the risk of people providing services for or on your behalf, criminally facilitating tax evasion. So people providing services, doing that which could land them as a man or woman in jail under the existing law. And once you have your risk assessment, everything else hangs off that because you will need to put in place proportionate procedures designed to prevent those risks. Now, what we're talking about here is just classic risk management. Now, when I talk to people who work in tax about this, they will look aghast and say, I do not know how to manage risk. These six principles look very, very different to me. But as soon as they speak to their colleagues in financial crime or in compliance or they speak to their MLROs, they will say to them, these six things are what I do all day long. Identify risks, take steps to mitigate risks, see how well they're working, go back to the beginning of the procedure. Now, it is very likely, I would think, if you are a business that works in, for example, the financial sector, in manufacturing, in legal, in accounting, anything like that, if you work in a regulated sector, you're probably going to identify a lot of risks. But that doesn't mean that you have a lot of work to do. Because if you are regulated, you are regulated because you are inherently high risk of financial, facilitating financial crime or being complicit in it. So you are already doing, I would guess, a lot of risk management. So let's say you identify 100 risks. You may find that actually, when you map on your existing procedures, these are risks that you are aware of and you are already managing. So once you've done your risk assessment, I would suggest a very good second step before creating any new procedures is to consider what you already do and map that onto your risks. And then look at the gap between what you already do and what you think you need to do to manage those risks. Now, typical gaps that I have found when stress testing businesses is as I say, they often focus on the client risk, or they often focus on that stage one risk. But you're not trying to prevent tax evasion. You're trying to prevent your people from becoming deliberately complicit in that tax evasion. So that is often the gap. And also thinking about the jurisdictional reach of this. Typically, businesses will say, okay, well, I'll think about a tax loss in the jurisdiction I operate, but I'm not bothered about other countries, or I don't need oversight of other countries. So those are the two big areas that I've personally found when looking at businesses' procedures as they stand to be the areas where they need help or they need additional procedures. So once you have your risk assessment and you've got your procedures, please, please document it. I have heard a lot of horror stories from advisors and from investigators where when they're conducting a bribery act investigation, they will go to a business and say, look, someone's paid a bribe, you know, under caution, we need to talk. And the business will say, well, that's fine because here's my massive booklet of reasonable procedures, often sometimes wheeling in cases and cases of paperwork. And investigators will say, well, that's great. You know, this, this looks like a reasonable procedures defense. Can I just see the risk assessment so I understand how what you're doing is proportionate to the risks you face? And they will look blankly at them and say either what risk assessment or no, we did do a risk assessment five years ago, but Bob did that and he's retired and he didn't save the file on the shared system. Genuine excuse I've heard. So please, when you do your risk assessment and you invest the time and effort into it, store it somewhere, make sure the relevant people that are gonna be putting in place these procedures have access to it and that it can be a live document. A very good way to think about this is, if your company gets indicted for this, you are going to have to nominate someone to give evidence on behalf of your business. Who is that person going to be? Because they are probably going to want to be involved with this right from the beginning and have good oversight and control of that risk assessment process and a good overview of your procedures. So once you put your procedures in place, it's not enough to trust that your staff will do what you ask them to do and not do what you tell them not to do. You have to think about the due diligence. And I'm going to skip over that for the moment because we're going to come back to it in a second with a diagram. So you have your risk assessment, your procedures, your due diligence to make sure people are doing what you tell them to do. This is probably going to involve some level of change in your business. And judging by some of the indictments we've seen for businesses being involved or complicit in facilitating tax evasion before now, it might be quite a large change for some organizations. So you're going to need a top-level commitment within your business to drive and champion that change. 
Now, what I have found when speaking to an awful lot of businesses, both within the UK and overseas, is you will often find that junior members of staff get this. They have been on a lot of anti-money laundering training. They have grown up in a world where compliance is a hot topic. Senior people in a business will often be in the same position of junior members of staff in the sense that it is their money on the line, it is their reputation on the line, they want to drive change. It is middle management where you often have to change hearts and minds. So, for example, if a staff member, a junior member of staff, comes to their manager in middle management and says, I'm working on something, it looks suspicious, you know, I suspect money laundering, I suspect tax evasion, it's got all the red flags, I think we need to do a suspicious activity report, your middle management needs to say, you know, yes, this is how we follow the company's procedures on doing this. What they should not be doing is putting pressure on junior members of staff to ignore your legal obligations and ignore your company's procedures because A, it is going to be too timely or it is going to be too costly. So you want to incentivize your middle managers where a lot of the day-to-day -day control rests to actively do what you want them to do. Now, if you've got procedures, you need to train your staff in what they are. It is no good, for example, having a whistleblowing hotline if your staff cannot find the number to the whistleblowing hotline. So you need to communicate them and you need to train them. And a lot of people will say to me, well, isn't that going to cost a fortune, you know? Aren't we going to have to buy these really expensive training packages? Now, my training package for my staff would probably say something like, don't commit fraud in the office. Don't forge documents and don't lie. If a client asks you to do something that you think is suspicious or you feel uncomfortable with, don't do it and please tell your manager or please submit something to this anonymous help inbox. It does not have to be complicated. And lastly, you need to monitor and review what you're doing. So you need to keep your risk assessment under review. You need to keep under review your procedures to think about how effective they are. Now, there is no set time period for how often you should do that. Some businesses work on a 12-month annual review cycle, some review every other year. Think about working into this, this into your business as usual. So if you conduct a general review every 12 months of your financial crime prevention, perhaps think about fitting this into this, because after all, tax evasion is a predicate offense for money laundering. Now, if we just go to the last slide in our slide deck, I said that I would come back to due diligence. Now, if a lot of people listening to this perhaps don't work in compliance, it can often be quite difficult, I think, to understand, well, how do I approach this? Now, my lawyer who worked on this with me often says to me quite in a quite, quite a patronizing tone, Jen, there is a thing we call the golden triangle of crime or the golden triangle of fraud. For people to commit crime requires three things. They need to have the motive, the means, and the opportunity. And once I got over how patronizing I thought that sounded when he said it to me over a cup of tea, I, I realized that actually his 20 years at the criminal bar may have taught him something. So thinking about why would someone do something in office hours that could land them in jail, there must be a motive behind it. People don't put their lives on, on the line like that for no reason. Now, typically, that is either that they are financially incentivized to take that risk or that there is pressure from their management to take that risk. And I must say that when looking at when things have gone wrong in other business areas, it is always one of both of those or both of them. So think about, okay, when we're putting in place these procedures, what would make our staff ignore them? What motive would they have? Are we financially incentivizing them to do something they shouldn't be doing? Or could their management be putting pressure on them? Now, I have heard a lot of horror stories around, for example, bonuses being paid based entirely on how much cash is onboarded by, for example, a wealth manager, and there being no regard for if that cash is compliant. Or, for example, people having targets that they have to hit or they will lose their job. Now, that would incentivize me to onboard at any risk without regard to if that cash was illicit. So then you think about, okay, well, who in my business has the means? Who in my business has the means to facilitate tax evasion in part of their job? Now, the very obvious example that I would think there is payroll, but then you can think about client-facing services as well. Now, people working in, for example, payroll do need to pay their staff. You can't remove people's means to facilitate tax evasion because it may be part of their legitimate day-to-day -day business. So I've noted down a few examples like payroll services, purchasing services, client services, but we can't remove the means, but the means tells us where some of our risks are. So which persons who are associated with our business can attract liability for us? Now, how we control that is thinking about how do these individuals have the opportunity to facilitate tax evasion? 
And that is where we put our due diligence. That's where we put our checks and balances. So it's just classic risk management. It doesn't have to be a new fancy control. The classic one is a second pair of eyes. If someone is working in payroll, is there someone who can, for example, do a random sampling of the payroll receipts or could, for example, be a second pair of eyes on different files? Um, for anyone there who's ever submitted an expenses claim to your business, typically you have to provide receipts and get your manager to sign it off. That's just the classic second pair of eyes control. So what we're not talking about is thinking about a whole new way of working. We're looking at applying existing controls to risks that we potentially hadn't considered before. And when people say, well, what do I look out for? It's the classic fraud risks, things like secrecy, sole, ac sole access to documents. Um, you can get a lot of free training online around what does fraud risk look like, and these are not new concepts. And I'm aware that you're going to be taken through a number of examples now, so I'll leave it there. But if anyone does have any questions, I really would encourage you to submit them, and we can go through them. Thank you, Jen. That was excellent and extremely insightful. I uh, really appreciate you coming along today. Um, so, uh, welcome. Uh, from BDO's perspective, my name is James Eggert. I'm a tax risk partner in London. I'm uh, uh, lucky enough to be joined by Ed Dwan, also a tax risk partner, and Martin Callahan, a senior manager in our tax disputes team. So. Um, I'm not sure how we could top that because that was extremely helpful, but what we could probably do is provide some uh, thinking and some experiences of what uh, some of our clients have been asking specifically. And uh, I suppose our job and, and my job is to think practically and pragmatically on how, what this means in practice for you and um, how you can demonstrate some of those reasonable procedures and the uh, risk assessment that uh, Jen so uh, kindly uh, described. So uh, in front of you, you've got uh, some highlights from the uh, CCO legislation. Uh, Jen's already covered uh, most of these points already, so I'll try not to uh, repeat much of it, although uh, Jen's already stolen most of my thunder. But um, I think one of the key areas that I do want to look at is associated persons again. Uh, it is important to state, and this is a question that we get quite a lot on, who is the associated person? Now, it's important to state that this is any person which can, can include an individual or corporate who provides services for or on behalf of an organization. Now, this can be employees, agents, contractors, etc. It is not necessarily the same as somebody who provides services to uh, the corporate. This is often a question of function rather than form. And so what we'll do is I'll... Uh, go through some examples a bit later on, but this is always an important first question to cover. Now, um, some of the implications of the new legislation, I thought Jen was very polite not to uh, mention these in too much detail, but um, if we look at the sanctions first, we do have a successful prosecution on the organization which can lead to A, an unlimited fine, B, a public record of the conviction, and C, of course, a, a significant reputational damage both internally and externally. Um, so, uh, as some of you may know, if you know me, uh, uh, we work a lot in the area of senior accounting officer and tax strategy, which has got certain quantifiable penalties. But when we deal with something like this, uh, there is an unlimited fine, which has definitely brought it to uh, a lot of our uh, clients' notice. Um, going back to the top, uh, once again, just to recap, there is no de minimis to this, and the legislation is relevant to all businesses, including, again, corporate bodies and partnerships whatever their size and industry sector. And it's important to think about it globally as well because the reach is very broad. The overseas offence, for example, applies to all businesses worldwide, which has some UK nexus. Now, Martin will go through some of those examples later on. Now, in terms of timing, as a reminder, the legislation went through roll assent as part of the Criminal Finances Bill, now Act, in, at the end of April, so just a few weeks ago. Uh, and we expect implementation, looking at Jen, to uh, take place at the end of September or early October because of parliamentary time. Um, but for most of us, uh, the key first step is being able to demonstrate ad adequate defense of having reasonable prevention procedures in place. Now, before I look at that in more detail, especially the risk assessment, I'm going to hand over to Martin to bring it to life with some case studies. Yeah. Over to you. Great. Thanks very much, James. Uh, well, Jenny has already described the offences very clearly. Thank you. Um, I am just going to break them down again into their, into their component, component parts. Look, initially at the domestic offence, uh, stage one, someone needs to have deliberately evaded UK tax. And I think it's worth repeating that the offence applies to all taxes, direct and indirect. 
And it's important to bear this in mind when identifying risk areas within the business. So it might be an invoicing risk or a customs duty risk or an employee taxes risk. And all relevant areas of the business should be identified and involved in that initial risk assessment. We go on to stage two, the deliberate facilitation by an associated person. And as James has mentioned, you know, associated person, it really is very, very key. It's very, very widely defined. So the question to ask yourself is, do you know who your associated persons are? You must identify those with whom you do business and may fall within the definition. And as we've heard, the definition includes employees, but can include contractors, subsidiary companies, and even third parties who provide services for or on behalf of the organization. And when considering this, you really need to think about the proximity of that third party to your business. How integral is that third party to, your, to, what, to what you're doing? And if stages one and two, we get to stage three, the strict criminal liability. Um, and it's worth noting that if the tax, UK tax has been um, evaded, the offence applies to all corporates, regardless of where that corporate is located. We move on now to the overseas offence, very, very similar to the UK offence. There needs to have been deliberate evasion and facilitation, and the legislation is very clear, it's explicit in saying that neither the evasion nor the facilitation need to take place in the UK. There does need to be this concept of dual criminality, i.e. the tax evasion and facilitation offences need to be criminal in both the UK and overseas jurisdiction but there does need to be this, this nexus between the corporate, or sort of the relevant body, and the UK. So UK company or partnership is very clearly within scope. An overseas corporate with a permanent establishment in the UK is within scope. Um, and as mentioned before, if the employees of an overseas corporate were to travel to the UK and facilitate tax evasion whilst in the UK, again, that corporate would be within the scope of the legislation. I'm now going to run through a couple of case studies, one in respect of the domestic offence and one in respect of the offence. So case study one, a UK company contracts for services with an agency and that agency provides services for and on behalf of UKCO. Now, considering all relevant factors, the agency is an associated person of UKCO. And it's a point we've made before and it's a point that we'll make many times over it's absolutely key here to identify your associates. Now, that agency deliberately facilitates tax evasion, in this case through off-payroll, cash-in-hand payments. The UK company is strictly liable in this example unless it can prove the defence of having reasonable prevention procedures in place. Move on to the overseas offence. UK Co has a contract in place with a third-party supplier based in France. Let's call it... I don't know, France Co. France Co is effectively an integral part of the UK company business and is an associated person. France Co deliberately facilitates the evasion of French tax by one of its contractors. And again, UK Co could be, will be within the scope of the offence. And the point I'd like to make strongly here is, is, is with regards to extended supply chains. Um, if a company has a contract in place with a third party, which then onward subcontracts, the question has been asked many times, well, how far down the supply chain does the company's responsibility extend? And in this example, I say, well, there is an obligation absolutely to have identified the main contractor as an associated person and then carried out the necessary steps of due diligence um, and any other relevant steps. However, there isn't an obligation to carry out that same level of checks throughout the supply chain. What is reasonable and proportionate will depend upon the proximity of the contractor and subcontractor and the level of control the company has over the subcontractors. And for my final slide here, through our conversations with a number of organisations, we've developed a large number of case studies, situations where evasion and facilitation may take place. I'm going to refer back to Jenny's final slide. You know, who has the motive, means, opportunity to facilitate tax evasion? Example one here, um, a member of your payroll, HR or payroll team deliberately falsifies information relating to a worker so that that worker is treated as a contractor rather than deducting PAYE at source. We've also heard evidence you know, of, of cases where um, 
um, expense payments have been falsely identified as expenses where in fact, in reality, it ought to have been taxable income. So what's the answer to all of this? It turns neatly to, well, you need to have reasonable uh, prevention policies and procedures in place. And on that point, I will hand back to James. Thank you, Martin. Um, hopefully some of those case studies were helpful. Uh, I must say, when we first um, were going through the legislation, uh, uh, what I like to do is draw a lot of stickmen on the board uh, and try and understand some of the case studies, um, because for me, uh, having some tangible examples of where facilitation of tax evasion could take place uh, was a very helpful first start. Um, so we've looked some, at some of the theory, we've looked at some of the examples. What I really liked in Jem's presentation uh, was, uh, because I'm quite practical, was the bit at the end where we looked through those six separate uh, items, which were the principle-based approach, which are those uh, six defenses at the bottom of the screen in front of you. Um, and for most of our clients and most of the uh, conversations we're having, it is around the pragmatic, uh, practical approach in being able to demonstrate those defenses. But just backtracking, let's think of some of the questions that you may have already been thinking about. The key questions that we get are, first of all, who needs to take ownership of this within the organization? Is it tax or is it illegal? And we'll come to that again at the end. Uh, and if we forget to, please do ask us the question. Uh, our obvious question again is how much work does this involve for you? Um, obviously there's uh, an increasing number of compliance requirements uh, within various organizations and dependent on your industry and does this add significantly to it? The key one that we've already looked at is how do we define associated persons and who are they for our particular industry? What is the risk therefore that these associated persons are facilitating tax evasion? What prevention procedures do we already have in place to manage this risk? Do we have any gaps in our procedures? What do we need to do to be compliant? And finally, are we looking at something which needs to be gold-plated or otherwise? Now, fortunately, and I'm not just saying this because Jen's in the room, HMRC have been very, very helpful in providing guidance to help us answer those questions. Now, as we've heard already, there is a defense of having reasonable procedures in place. Now at the bottom, this aligns to those of the Bribery Act, so uh, some of you are already familiar with them, but it should be pointed out that where the Bribery Act refers to adequate procedures, uh, the legislation here refers to reasonable prevention procedures. So what does this mean? To be reasonable means prevention procedures should be proportionate to the risks the organization faces. As such, and no surprise, the natural and very first step is to undertake an assessment of the risk that relevant bodies associated persons may be facilitating tax evasion. As such, the risk assessment is key to this and central to much of HMRC guidance and the points that Jen was making earlier. In terms of the other defences, Jen did go through them in detail, but just to repeat and recap, going from left to right, top level commitments. This is the tone from the top. Very important to get board or senior management level buy-in, to develop a high-level policy in relation to tax evasion. Due diligence, again, important, enabling you to undertake procedures when appointing contractors, employees, and others who could be associated persons. Proportionality, once again, are existing procedures reasonable and the risk assessment will play a significant part in this. And we have already talked about comms and training and I thought your example, Jen, was very helpful on that, on how communications can take place within the business. Often, you will have existing AML procedures, you might have anti-money laundering, you might have some anti-slavery procedures even. And to what extent can you leverage off those? To what extent can you bolt on additional modules, for example, on tax evasion. Monitoring and review, of course, once you've got the procedures in place. So moving on to the next page, and I noted, quite, you know, we didn't prepare this at all, but uh, Jen did mention the words, everything hangs off this, and it's true. We do see that the first stage is the risk assessment, and it's very difficult to determine what your procedures are like until you've undertaken this. 
And another comment that we've heard in previous presentations is that you must document your risk assessment. And we've seen that not happening previously in terms of the bribery act. So let's think about this practically. At BDO, we've had quite a few conversations and we've had quite a bit of work with various organizations, including our own, and how we need to undertake this risk assessment. The approach that we've taken and the approach we would recommend to all organizations is to consider firstly where there is a risk of an associated person facilitating tax evasion. Now, as HMRC has said previously to us, it is about putting yourself in the seat of the facilitator of tax evasion. So where could these associated persons be and how could they be facilitating tax evasion? Now, once you've undertaken that thought process, what we recommend is that for each of those risk areas, first of all, you consider the quantifiable impact, the threat likelihood, if you like, based on, for example, the money flowing through. So what is the quantum of that risk? And what we've done then for each of the identified risk areas, our approach focuses on identifying and assessing vulnerability factors. Again, we're stolen from HMRC guidance. And when you look at the level of vulnerability there, what we've thought about are various factors within the guidance, such as country risk. So for example, do you have any activities in jurisdictions that could be considered a tax haven? Another factor is transaction risk, where certain types of transaction could give rise to higher risks. For example, no surprise, cash transactions or any transactions involving some element of secrecy. And I think Jen mentioned those as well. In the control score, we have various control factors that make up this. Now, no surprise at all, but this includes those defenses we've just talked about, such as due diligence, top level, commitment, etc. So for each of those various risk areas, what do you have in place? Do you have any elements of due diligence already there? What monitoring do you have in place for that? So we believe that having some kind of standardized or dedicated approach to your risk assessment will help provide some of that documentation and evidence that we were discussing previously for the risk assessment, something to demonstrate that you've thought about that. And once this is done, you'll be able to determine the necessary approach for determining whether or not your prevention procedures are reasonable. So the key message here is that it is impossible to determine the reasonableness of any prevention procedures without this risk assessment. And as such, it's a critical first step. Now for our clients, there are also some specific further questions on this. And Ed, hand over to you to discuss a few of these. Thanks very much, James. Um, okay, so the this final slide um, is, is really all about um, conversations we've had with clients who are potentially looking at how do they address the, 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 um, the risk assessment and how, and how do they do that themselves. And I guess it's just highlighting some of the challenges that they face in doing that. And, I, and to, to be honest with you, it, it, it sort of highlight some of the areas that we're actually working with clients on at the moment as, as a consequence. So I think one of the first points is, is really this, this whole bit about recognizing the sheer breadth and scope of this legislation, the, the worldwide aspects of it, um, the all taxes nature, etc., does mean that it is quite difficult, particularly in large organizations, to be confident that you have comprehensively covered the whole landscape. That is clearly very important for you to be able to do because if you haven't got the entire landscape as part of your risk assessment, and that could be done at quite a high level, but nevertheless, if you haven't managed to do that, it, it, it would suggest that the whole risk assessment is to a degree flawed by how incomplete that actually is. And I think certainly some of the work we've done with organizations around other regulatory things, such as things like self uh, senior accounting officer, 
um, regulations has suggested that actually many organisations struggle to get the full breadth of new legislation when it first comes out. So that's certainly an area that needs looking at, and I would say a key area within that is this identification of associated persons. I think once you've done your risk assessment, one of the other key challenges is defining what you consider to be low risk. Because it's quite clear from the revenue guidance that areas of low risk, effectively, so long as they remain low risk, do not really require further scrutiny. So that's a key upside, if you like, but it's only an upside if you've correct, correctly identified something as being low risk. And I think one of the difficulties that we found when talking to businesses is they, they struggle a bit to understand what, where, where you draw the line, if you like, around what is and what isn't low risk. The third point here is, is around documentation, and I think Jen highlighted that pretty clearly, that there is a danger that people might go off and produce thousands and thousands of pages of documents, but if you haven't got the clarity of a risk assessment that underpins that and demonstrates why you've taken certain actions, then that's going to make the ability to get the reasonable prevention procedures defence in place, that's going to make it a lot harder for that to stand up. So being able to produce some documentation that clearly headlines the, both the extent of the risk assessment but also the findings of it is absolutely key. The fourth point is that once you've done your risk assessment, it's important for those areas that aren't low risk that you've identified some action points that demonstrate how you intend to manage that risk going forward. I think everyone recognises that this is new legislation and therefore I think the revenue guidance itself already says that what looks like being reasonable prevention procedures this September may look somewhat different to what they'd expect to see a couple of years down the line. Part of that will undoubtedly be this whole point about what are the recommended remedial actions that come out of the risk assessment and to what extent have they actually been enacted over the, the coming months and years. And again, this, this fits into the whole uh, position here where this is going to form part of an annual or biannual cycle of um, risk management. And then the final point is obviously the key one. Once you've done all this work, have you actually met the definition of reasonable prevention procedures? And I think it's fair to say that most of the, the, the businesses we've spoken to recognize that as we sit here today, they may struggle a bit to, to actually form that judgment solely themselves. And I think furthermore, I think they recognize that they, they themselves might be taking something of a risk if they, if they decide to articulate that and that then gets challenged further down the line um, and the extent to which they're, they're comfortable that that will stand up to that level of scrutiny. Okay, so that completes the, the formal part of the webinar to give you a, an idea of where we are. Um, I know we've had a number of questions that have come up while we've all been uh, waffling on. Well, I have been waffling on anyway. Um, so I don't know if uh, we've got, I've got one that's just sat in front of me, so I'll, one for Jen, I think. Does the legislation apply to charities, Jen? Uh, yes, it does. It's actually something we say in the guidance that, yes, this can apply to charities. And we have seen charities used as a vehicle on numerous occasions to facilitate tax evasion, um, so it's not a low-risk sector by any means. What I would say is charities are going to, I think, have a limited type of risk of facilitation of tax evasion involved with them, so I think their controls are going to be less stringent than businesses who face risks on a number of fronts. Um. Thank you. I've just got a, a question in. Um, whose responsibility, tax or legal? That's a, that's a good question, and it's definitely not the first time uh, I've heard that. So um, I, I suppose I refer to this 
earlier on in terms of who needs to take the lead on uh, corporate criminal offences within the business. And I suppose what we're seeing from our own experience, and this is based on quite a lot of conversations we've had with, with a lot of clients, is that uh, typically this lands on the desk of the head of legal or the head of risk or head of compliance. Uh, head of ethics as well. I've seen head of um, uh, the head of head of risk. Often, as I've said before, tends to be the one who likes to take the lead on this. Um, but in our experience, uh, often the responsibility for ensuring the risks are identified and in relation to some of the policies tends to fall on the tax function, if there is one, or the head of finance. So to answer the question. Um, what I do see is that it is a collaborative approach with tax and legal teams often working together. And I know many of the risk assessments that we've done, uh, including initial calls, has been both to the head of risk uh, or legal and also uh, the tax finance teams. Um, so it does seem to be a collaborative uh, approach. The, other, the only other thing I would say on that, James, is that I, I think even where in organizations where the head of tax is not in the driving seat on this one, I would imagine they would want to be fully up to speed with what is going on in it because I suspect going forwards this will form part of business risk reviews for larger corporates, those, those kind of interactions with HMRC generally. Yeah. So, uh, so I, think, I think ultimately it's an answer for the organization. There is no absolute right or wrong answer to that one, so almost someone is taking ownership but I think it is important if there is a tax function for them to be fully aware of what's, what's happening. And as, at the end of the day, uh, and Jen is, being, is in the room as well, obviously this is something which is uh, uh, quite HMRC-led. Uh, uh, HMRC are being very articulate about it. And, uh, of course, uh, um, as we are seeing various HMRC guidance on it, this also would tend to push it towards the head of taxes desk. Um, I would definitely add to that, um, and maybe this is just because I come from a tax background, business is on the line. Do not leave it to tax and give them no resource to do this, because I have had many a person working in tax come genuinely crying to me, saying, I'm still trying to do the common reporting standard in FATCA. I do not have the time to do this. If you leave it to someone who does not have the expertise, who does not understand crime and risk management and who does not understand your company's existing procedures for things like anti-money laundering, anti-bribery, does not understand risks and controls, you are setting yourself up to fail. Perhaps you, and one department I've spoken to does have someone who is a tax lawyer who used to work in crime and financial risk management, they were probably well placed. But you need a number of areas of expertise to bring this all together. Thank you. I don't think I've had anybody in tears quite yet, but I can definitely see some of those frustrations in place. Um, I, I, I think I'll, I've got a question here which I'll open up to uh, the forum, perhaps to you, Jen. Is the legislation likely to make the UK a less attractive place from which to purchase services? Which I think is an interesting question that I've got. Um, if I could perhaps rephrase this to you, is the legislation likely to make the UK a less attractive place from which to purchase criminal services? Yes, I really do hope so. Um, fraud has been criminal for quite some time. Every major financial centre in the world is going to unknowingly and unwittingly harbour criminals because that's what happens if you're a major financial centre. What we're doing is trying to make sure that businesses are disincentivised from, if they operate in the UK, being complicit in fraud. So yes, we do hope to reduce fraudulent business and criminal business in the UK through these measures. Okay, I've got a, a linked one that I think I know the answer to because we had a conversation before, but I'll ask it anyway. So, on dual criminality, will HMRC be publishing a list of countries which have the relevant legislation in place so we know where to prioritise our work? Um, I can very quickly give you a list, which is essentially if you are facilitating tax evasion in the Ascension Islands, the Pitcairn Islands, or St. Helena, you might not be covered. Anywhere else, I think you've pretty much got dual criminality. Anywhere that has a taxation system, it is likely, highly likely, if not absolutely certain, that they are going to make it a crime to deliberately not pay those taxes and for it to be a crime to deliberately help someone not to pay those taxes. If we're talking about a country that doesn't have any kind of taxation, 
the dual criminality test is not going to be met, that you were never going to be in a position of helping someone not to pay their taxes in a country that has no taxation system. What I would suggest businesses should focus on is thinking about how do we stop people when they're providing services for or on behalf of us committing fraud or becoming complicit in fraud. It shouldn't really matter which country suffers as a result of that criminal action. It's not about who suffers. It's about stopping your people from doing things that are already criminal under the existing law. Right, great. I've got a question here about stage two of the offence. This is a um, facilitation offence. Does the legislation catch negligent or unwitting facilitation? I think, well, absolutely the basic answer is no. I mean, it has to be the deliberate facilitation of, of tax evasion. Um, if a tax evader misuses the service, your services, then again, the corporation will not be caught. I guess the only caveat I'd say, I'd put to that is, well, if someone is caught evading tax and you've provided services to them, I think it then becomes an evidential point as to whether or not there was an element of deliberate facilitation there, and that's where the risk assessment and, and other guiding principles must, must be borne in mind. What I would also say is, um, for anyone in the regulated sector, if your person has negligently facilitated tax evasion, you are probably going to have your regulator breathing down your neck and asking, why did your financial crime prevention systems and controls not kick in? Why did you not catch this? So you may not have criminal liability, but you may have a problem with your regulator. So if you do uncover it, you're going to want to make sure that you follow your existing legal obligations. So for example, that you, if you uncover that, you submit a suspicious activity report and you do the necessary things with your regulator. Because if you cover that up, you are now knowingly concerned in it and potentially complicit. So it's very important that staff understand their existing legal obligations. I also think that there, there is a, a sense where people um, need to define properly what, what someone doing something unwittingly and negligent is, and the difference between that and turning a blind eye to something. So, you know, the classic example, I think, for me is if you've got a scenario where a supplier asks, who's, who's UK-based, who lives in the UK, who asks you to pay for their services in a, a, an offshore tax haven. Now, if there's no business reason why they would ask you to do that, I would say that is not being negligent or unwitting. That's someone who is who is effectively either turning a blind eye or knowingly assisting someone. And and so I think there is it is important to get the definitions around that correct. Um, I've got a question here which says, uh, how much do we have to do by September? And uh, uh, is it a uh, some kind of cut-off date. Um, we, we've talked about how the legislation went through Royal Assent in April, and um, it's going through Parliament in uh, September October. And um, what we hear from HMRC, and no doubt, Jen, you can, you can confirm or, or deny this, is that what we're looking at is uh, definitely to uh, take, undertake this risk assessment um, by that time to understand where uh, you have the risk of associated persons and also to determine where there are potential gaps in your prevention procedures. Um, what I've heard historically, um, and hopefully I'm right here, is that um, where you'll be in year one uh, will look very different to where you'll look in year three, four, and five. So uh, the general consensus is that you can't be expected to have uh, all of your prevention procedures uh, up and running and, and robust. Uh, as soon as September comes, but the key message really is to determine where you have uh, your risk areas, where you're vulnerable, what controls you've got in place, and to develop a roadmap to put in those prevention procedures uh, over the uh, period subsequent. Would you add anything to that, Jim? Um, I, helpfully, for all those people asking this question, drafted a whole piece of guidance on this very topic. Um, read the guidance, guys, please, I beg you. I, you'll be the only person other than my mum who's read it if you do. What I would say is a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that the criminal law and regulation are the same thing. They are not. You are not required by law to put in place any procedures whatsoever. You can decide that you have an absolutely crazy risk appetite and you don't even want a reasonable procedures defense. That's fine. A regulator cannot come to you, HMRC cannot come to you, the serious fraud office cannot come to you and say, 
show me your procedures as part of a day-to-day -day review of your business because you are not required by law to have them. If we come to you and ask to see your procedures, it's going to be an interview under caution because things have already gone wrong for you. You've already had that facilitation of tax evasion offence. So it's not a case of what am I required by law to do on day one, so you know, in October, let's say. The question is, what is it going to be reasonable for you to have done? And ultimately, you are not going to be convincing me that it's reasonable. If it all goes wrong, you're going to be convincing 12 complete strangers on a jury that what your business did was reasonable. That is the best way I can tell you to pitch it. These are not people that are going to share your woes that you have been too busy with other matters, such as the common reporting standard. They're going to be 12 lay people asking, is what that business has done reasonable? So what we suggest is a sensible approach, though you are by no means required by law to do this, is to do a risk assessment, document it, and have a roadmap, a plan, a timeline in place as to how you're going to address those risks. That way, if something happens in, let's say, March, and you haven't trained that member of staff who committed the breach, you can go to a jury and you can say, ah, yes, we had understood that risk, we documented it, and you can see from our timeline that this is why we haven't, for example, put in place the due diligence, conducted the training. There is a reason and a rationale and a story behind all of this. If you have not gone through that process, you're going to struggle, I would suggest, to convince the jury that you taking no action was reasonable. So I've got an interesting one here. So uh, what do we do in a very high-risk scenario? And they've given us a high-risk scenario. Okay. So e.g. an export supplier from an African country asking us to contract with their Belize stroke BVI tax haven subsidiary. Oh, quite specific. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of the MP that said, let's just say you were using the following tax structure. Um, so that individual, please do not take this as legal advice. What I would say is you have to understand why is that situation high risk? What is it about it that is high risk? A lot of people throw the term tax haven about casually. I'm not really interested in tax rates. It's not illegal to have a low or zero tax rate for whatever category of taxation. I'm worried about things that are hallmarks of fraud, and that is, for example, secrecy. If we're talking about a high secrecy jurisdiction, and you can get those ratings, they're all public on the FATF website, on the Global Forum website, it's all rated for you, there are huge detailed reports. If you're talking about a complex structure that seems to evolve a lot of secrecy with countries or jurisdictions that have a high secrecy rating, that might be high risk to you because you have very little oversight of what is going on. The classic thing you would do in that situation, I think typically as a business already, would be to say, I don't understand why you've set this up in this way. It seems to create a tax risk. Can you give me an explanation? That's what I would do if a client came to me and said, you know, I want an offshore structure, use a pan Panamanian bearer share company. Can you route it through Belize and can it go into my Swiss account? I'd say, yep, potentially I can do that, but you need to give me a business reason. I need to understand what's behind this. If you are given a reason, if you are shown documentation, if you have no reason to suspect that it's suspicious, you can carry on. But you would want to make sure that those things, those red flags that are showing you that this is high risk, you have something in place to manage that, and that is kept under review. I'd agree. And the, 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 the additional point, I would guess, is that that goes back to the second pair of eyes piece as well. Yep. Because I think sometimes some people are too close to the bits of the business that they're actually operating in, and it's hard for them to necessarily be able to stand back from that and see the wider risk, which is why I think you would encourage in that scenario that across the board there is the, the, the opportunity for someone who's not directly involved in that particular commercial transaction to take the final view. Um, yeah, I've got a very, very quick question here. Um, are there any de minimis limits for tax evasion? I do have to put in place controls to cover tax evasion over £100. I guess the basic principle is there are no, there is no day minimis. However, I said um, the point we've made before is that any policies, procedures need to be proportionate to the risk. And so I guess if there is a, a very low risk of, of evasion, then the, you know, the, the policies and procedures will be will be minimal, or in fact, you know, potentially none. Um, I, I guess on, on materiality, though, the one thing I would say is. If you have a zero tolerance to tax evasion, you have a zero tolerance to tax evasion. And, and I guess the message, certainly when you're looking at things like the tone from the top, the message has to be, we don't we don't allow tax evasion full stop. If you start getting into, apart from the odd hundred quid here or there, I think you 
start struggling. Um, we, we are getting a lot of questions thick and fast. I, I suggest we do two or three more because I'm aware of the time. And so the one I've got is, uh, if I can read it, uh, for FCA authorised and regulated financial institutions, will this be an addition to the standard AML procedures or is it assumed to be covered by the current regulations? So I think I know the answer to, to that. So um, uh, it's, it's common to quite a few questions we get where if you have AML or anti-bribery or, or such like procedures, what more do you need to do? Um, in, in our view, I think a lot of those existing procedures may be to some extent relevant, um, but it's obviously essential and, and no surprise here that risk assessment, which is specific to this facilitation of tax evasion, is carried out and then mapped to existing procedures. Uh, and then there are likely to be gaps because obviously uh, the AML uh, will be a subset of the uh, corporate criminal offence. Uh, and although it's a very good basis, um, what we're seeing is that uh, there may be additional um, uh, uh, gaps which need to be met. And some of that could be really basic. So if you go on most large corporates' websites, they will have a great amount of detail about anti-money laundering, anti-corruption uh, offences, and, and the, the messages from the senior executives within that organisation to their approach on it. Typically, they have nothing about tax evasion. And, and so if nothing else, I think those kind of policies and procedures will need refreshing. A question here. Um, if we are a UK subsidiary of a US company, then do we have to worry about everything the wider US-based company does? I think the, the basic principle there is if the US company is in some way facilitating UK tax evasion, then that UK company is going to potentially be within the scope of the, of the domestic offence. Um, now, that scenario would be very different if you had a US company with, a say, a permanent establishment or branch in the UK, and by virtue of that structure, the US company would be within the scope of, of all of the legislation, both the UK offence and the overseas offence. Um, so I would just add one thing to that, which is people often, especially those of us who work in tax, don't understand the criminal law concept of a legal as opposed to a natural person. So it's helpful to think of entities as men and women. So a subsidiary is a separate legal entity. It is a separate person. It is, if you like, your child. I, as a parent, would not be indicted for murder if that murder was committed by my child. You have to indict a specific legal entity. A branch is, if you like, a hand of a legal person. So a branch cannot commit an act. It is that whole legal entity. So if you are a UK branch of a US headquartered company, it is all of that body that is indicted. You do not say the hand committed murder, you say the person committed murder. Um, so if you are a UK subsidiary, you don't have to worry about what your parent company does at all. It's a separate legal person. It's not your responsibility. You worry about you as an individual legal entity, as an individual person. If you are a branch, yes, I would be thoroughly concerned with what my US head office was doing because it's part of my legal body and any indictment is going to affect me as well as it. Brilliant. Um, okay, I think we'll, we'll finish off now. I have got a final question, which is actually uh, an easy question. Will the slides be circulated at any point? And the answer to that one is uh, yes. What we'll be doing is we have a list of everybody who uh, attended. I think we've got a list of everybody who uh, was also invited, so we'll make sure that's uh, uh, distributed together with a recording of uh, this, so you can fast forward and rewind as you wish to. Um, so thank you very much to everyone for dialing in today. I hope you found it useful. Thank you extremely to Jen for coming today and adding her wisdom. Um, if you do have any uh, questions supplemental to this, um, I believe that you can find our email addresses either as part of the invitation or on our website at some point, I'm sure. Um, so thank you again and have a pleasant afternoon.